and welcome to the Law Center Videocast. I'm your host and founder of the Law Center, Larry DeMarco. Thanks for joining us this evening. We go live on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., so please join us in the chat room on the right where you can interact live with other viewers. For those of you who have been watching my videos, please pause this and subscribe and click the notification bell and you'll support me in making videos, free videos for self-represented litigants in family court. Today I'm excited to share an interview I did with an old friend, Dr. Howard Braboy, a retired sociology professor at the College, of New Zer uh, the College of New Jersey. I did this interview at my first YouTube channel, Delaware County Political News, which then became PA Voter Information Network. And now my attention is here at the Law Center. My focus and gist of my interview with Dr. Raboy was political, relating to the legislative and executive branch, but it also applies to the judiciary. I asked him about sociology and what we can learn from sociology principles. Specifically, we discussed power and corruption in society and government and the study of one community in one place under certain, uh, under certain conditions. Dr. Raboy explains that the science of sociology teaches us that if you compare one place with another place under identical or very similar conditions, then you have a likelihood or probability of having similar results or conclusions in the other similar place. This teaches us that our experiences in family court in one county, state, or country are similar to other jurisdictions so we're not alone. I hope you enjoy my interview with Dr. Raboy. Today we are here with Dr. Howard Raboy. Dr. Raboy taught sociology for 40 years, 34 years at the College of New Jersey, where he was the chair of the sociology department for eight years. He was a member of the advisory board for security on campus for five years and published four editions of a co-edited book of readings in sociology. He also published 12 articles in refereed journals. Howard, thank you for joining us here today on Delaware County Political News. Pleasure to be here. Howard, you've been a sociology professor for 40 years. What is the study of sociology? <clears throat> sociology is the study of society and how it affects the individual and also you could say how the individual affects society. And so, uh, basically, we're looking at for patterns of, of uh, how people act as it varies by race, social class, uh, gender, uh, uh, ethnicity, religion, and we find that people of these various different categories on certain different thing, areas of life react differently. And that's what we look for to make generalizations, if I'm being too vague. Not at all. What are some of the methodologies of a sociologist? Well, the, the basic, one of the assumptions we make is that things aren't always the way they seem. So they appear one way on the surface, but to find out what's going on, you have to sort of look beyond that. So we, we do observation. We, we, there's another uh, type of methodology called participant observation. We're a part of a group and observe at the same time. There's survey research, which people fill out questionnaires. There's uh, interviewing, intensive interviews, where you um, sit down and talk to someone in detail. And in, by discussing things in detail, uh, you get all kinds of information. Um, these are just some of the ways we use to gather data. Why should we study sociology? <laughs> well, in one realm, sociology, besides keep increasing knowledge about how things work, keeps us honest um, because it, you, you people discover things about you and everybody else that is again different from the way it may appear on the outside. It, it goes runs against the individualism value of our society where people think it's all up to the individual. We know that's not the case. I mean the individual has some control over his or her behavior but we're looking at how society impacts on this and again we look for patterns. Tell me about social class, how that factors into the analysis. Well, generally, a lot of people think they're, they, if you ask them, they'll say they're middle class, but um, we have to d divide it, and there's different schemes of upper class, upper middle class, 
uh, middle class, lower middle class, upper lower class, and then the poor uh, at the bottom. And how, where you fall in this hierarchy has a great impact on how you perceive the world and how you act. And um, uh, it varies, uh, I'll give you one brief example. Uh, if someone is caught stealing in a store and they're taken to court, it's called shoplifting. If that person is further up in the class structure, they will be defined as a kleptomaniac and need counseling. So if you're further down the class structure, you're a criminal. If you're further up in the class structure, you did the same thing, but um, you are a, uh, um, you need counseling. Generally, the higher you are in the class structure, the more likely you're being viewed as a good person. And, and therefore, good people don't do bad things. So therefore, the, there's a great uh, breadth of tolerance in terms of what people do before they're labeled as deviant. And they're allowed to have, quote, idiosyncrasies. As you go further down the class structure, that range of accepted behavior is much narrower. And if you step out of line there, you're boom, all of a sudden, you're deviant. Because people expect you more likely to be deviant. So therefore, people at the top, it's white collar crime, get away with all kinds of things. Uh, and people further down are going to get caught. And also, the penalties as you go further up in the class structure are much lighter. White collar crime, a uh, person could steal uh, millions of dollars in white collar crime and get two years in a, a federal uh, prison, which is like a country club prison. Someone who holds up six liquor stores will be in a state prison somewhere for a long period of time. So there's, we assume equality, where it said all men and women are created equal, but we know that's not the case. And, and so how the inequality comes in, look, you can see it in terms of social class. Certain religions are, have higher status than the others, and minorities have lower status. So I mean, there's all kinds, of, many kinds of ways in which we're not all equal, and how we're not equal is these are some of the patterns that we look for. Please give us some examples on how we can use Social, sociology to control our environment okay. and take practical lessons from it. Okay. Again, things don't always things don't always seem the way they are. I mean, that's a good assumption. It's not true. Nothing's true 100 percent, but that's a pretty good assumption. And so, a sociologist uh, Bill Chambliss uh, was out in uh, Seattle, the University of Washington, and he wanted to study political corruption. And they said, "Don't study Seattle. I mean, it's a new city." Uh, go to Chicago, go to some old city where there's a political machine, there you're going to have lots of corruption. You said they, other sociologists? Yeah, or people in town, the, you know. So he, um, he went around Seattle and he noticed there were these illegal poker games going on in bars. There was a back room. He ignored their advice and decided right. to do it anyway. Yeah, right. And so he finds all kinds of corruption. And then why were these poker games allowed to go on? Because they were paying people off. All right. And then he kept studying this corruption going up the ladder to the point where he connected it to Spokane, the capital, and eventually by the, by the end of his book, it got to Washington. So this, he's, he has these national, uh, from national and statewide and local corruption going on. And in, in a place where it wasn't, suppo quote, wasn't supposed to be there because it's a new city. So the, my point is, a sociology point is, if you see corruption in a place like Seattle, where it's not supposed to be going on, take it to somewhere else with a similar background, and you're probably, if you sniff around, you're going to find it. Uh, I mean, not 100% of the time. And the thing about it is, if you look around and you don't see it, well, then you're done. That's okay. But if you do see it, well, then you know you, you have a choice of doing something about it. What did Lincoln Stephan learn when he studied major cities? Now again, this was, yes, 19, this this was, was 1906 or something like that. It was 1906, Howard, but he's still respected and this is still, uh, as sociologists, we can still take something from him, can't we? Yeah, I mean his book is called The Shame of the Cities. And when he did Philadelphia, the chapter is called Corrupting Contented. And um, Philadelphia had a political machine that was in power for a long time. In fact, the Republicans were in power until the 50s. Um, and so it was a real tight machine and things were, um, uh, it was extremely corrupt and there weren't many uh, ways of uh, exposing it. Uh, so, I mean, he found this in, around the country in, in diff different areas uh, of the country. So the, Philadelphia was just one of many. And the point of that was 
He found it in major cities. He found machines in cities. Isn't that yeah. right, Howard? Right. I mean, even around here, look how many mayors historically from Camden are in prison, have been in prison, as well as Atlantic City. I mean, you know, it's, uh, there's nothing new about this. And what was that phenomenon about cities that had machines or centralized power without a checks and balance or a separation of power system? Well, I mean, the, the, basically the assumption is the, the power corrupts. I mean, as again, not 100% of the time, but most of the time. And so when people are in power, and they're in power for a long time, you can expect corruption to occur. I mean, it shouldn't be a surprise that it's occurring. It should be, oh, well, what do you expect? You know, I mean, like New Jersey, which is in time, they say, for, and Louisiana for the most corrupt state in the country, I always say they should have a corruption museum because New Jersey has so many great examples of absurd corruption, obscene corruption. Um, and, uh, but, you know, you're going to have corruption, as I said, in most places. Now, the degree will vary and the, the extent of it will vary, but, but I, you can assume that you're going to have, you know, a corruption if you look around enough. Uh, yeah. And, and the, the re one of the reasons for this is we're all human. People get in office. To get in office, you need money to get you know, contributions. And people expect something back for their contributions to help you got, get in office. They expect favors. Or you're, you've been working in an industry for a long time. You run for political office. You have friends in that industry. So they start getting contracts. I mean, this, it's almost like human nature to take care of your friends. And, and this is corruption. And in cities, especially larger cities, you need more money yeah. and you need more friends to be able to hold power so you're going to find a larger corruption and, as Lincoln stepped right, right. And also the larger the, the, the city, the more uh, obscure things can get because you can't see things very clearly. If you're in a small town, it's very easy to see things. In a, in a large city, it's much more difficult to see things. What is the impact of society on people? Uh, many different ways. Uh, as I said, social class, uh, race, um, ethnicity, religion, age. Um, we, as, as we go from one category to another, it affects us. And it affects the way we behave and the way we look at the world. Oftentimes we're not aware of these differences because we sort of stay with people who are similar to us. And if you leave your safety zone and go out into different places, you'll see people who are very different. And, um, you know, it's like the Philadelphia accent, all right? But you go, f you go out to Lancaster County, you don't hear the Philadelphia accent anymore. It's the Midwest. Once you get beyond, you know, 50 miles, it's the Midwest in terms of how people speak. Well, if you don't go out there, you don't realize that people speak differently if you only stay in Philadelphia. Same thing in New York with a New York accent. Can you give me some examples of sociology in terms of economics? For um, instance, Paul Blumberg's oh, The Predatory oh, oh, the Society. Predatory, yeah, yeah, sure. What Blumberg found, and it, it's, it's a fascinating book, um, that he, he interviewed students, both traditional and non-traditional students, and the jobs, the part-time jobs they had. This was done at Queens College in New York. When he um, asked them these questions, he asked them, make, make a list of all the jobs you've ever had. And what is it in those jobs where you're required to do something that was either illegal or unethical? And he, over the number of years, he compiled all these and wrote this book. And he has it done by um, chapters based upon uh, different types of businesses. And he, he finds that in every business, almost every business, there's things done to, to, that are dishonest against the public. These, this is where the, the owner of the store were doing things to cheat the public. And oh, do you recall any examples oh, that many. you can give? Yes. Okay, can you give us a few. Okay, For now I'm not implicating all dry cleaners, all right? But many dry cleaners, it's funny, even in class when I had a student whose parents were dry cleaners, I'd say uh, the cleaning fluid is petroleum based, it's expensive. And what they find is, from people who work in dry cleaners, some dry cleaners, and I say some, uh, don't change the fluid as often as they should, so that you take your clothes in to get cleaned and it maybe get cleaned in other people's dirt if you take it in the wrong time. The other thing is, sometimes when people hand in, bring their garments in, they look at a suit or a dress and see it's not stained, it's not dirty. So what they'll do then is press it and send it out without cleaning it, 
And if there's a spot on there that they didn't see, oh, we made a mistake, we'll clean it again for you. But they, in a sense, what they're doing is just pressing it and sending it out. Florists are, have been known, when you go to a wedding, you want to you know, take the bouquets from the table home. Uh, if you go to a funeral, you don't bring flowers home from the funeral. So when, they, when he found in the, his study that when they do wreaths for a funeral, they have very pretty flowers in the front, but dead flowers in the back to give it depth. Uh, and you're paying for the dead flowers. Of course, you don't know that because you never check the reef to find out what's there. I mean, these are just little things where they're not likely to get caught, but they can make extra money. Uh, like in a produce place where they uh, put nicer strawberries at the top and less nice strawberries at the bottom of the pint that's wrapped up and you buy, you know, something like that. Uh, little things here and there, the nickel and dime you, but for, on a, on a week's business, they're nickel and diming lots of people, and it turn, those nickels and dimes turn into dollars. And the point is that there's not one industry that's bad, whether it's a produce stand or a dry cleaner or a law office. I, since I'm asking the question, Howard, we, we lawyers are certainly are targets of doing the same thing. The point is that it's human nature, that it's you find this type of behavior throughout society. Yeah. It's a human behavior through all types of social classes. Give me another example. Fish, uh, when you buy fish, you think it's flounder, or maybe flounder, or maybe some another fish that's substituted for flounder, but how would you know? Most people, you know, if you go to a restaurant and you order flounder, you may not be getting flounder, you may be getting flounder, but when they put the sauce on it and all that, you. And most people would never know. So they may be using tilapia or some less or pollock or some less expensive fish, substituting for some more expensive fish. I mean, this is the kind of things that, that he's talking about. Right. And the thing is, though, it also goes on on a higher level. You can also expect this is going on in corporations. Uh, you know, like if you look at uh, illegal dump sites, New Jersey is number one, I think it was 70 some illegal federal, not state, but federal dump sites in the state of New Jersey because over the years the people were dumping stuff into the water, into the ground, and um, they didn't care. And um, so I mean it, it's just another way they could save money but not disposing of it properly, so they didn't care. But there's corruption, I mean, in the business world, it, it's, I mean, people, are, it's profit oriented and people want to skirt the, the way of doing it the correct way to make extra profits. Right, and the, uh, just to restate, the title of the book wasn't this one predatory business or this, or predatory economics, it's the predatory society. society. Yeah. It's everyone, it's human behavior was the whole premise of his book. Correct, yeah. I mean, how do, I mean, look at, for example, look what's happening in, in the airline industry over the years where you get less and less leg room and so if you're my size, you 6'1", you don't fly certain bargain airlines because you don't want your knees behind your ears, you know, but, but they make more money, the more seats they can pile on the plane. So the public, you know, gradually they lower their standards of acceptable behavior and they, you know, and, um, and this continues on. Howard, let's take this analysis back to politics. Okay. If there's a political study of a certain demographic or certain social conditions, and you find corruption based upon those certain conditions. What can viewers predict about their own neighborhoods, townships, or counties if they see similar conditions in their own neighborhood, township, or county? I mean, it's like, I think Flint, Michigan with the water is a good example. Uh, one of the things people are now doing is having their water tested to find out the quality of their water uh, because of, of the corruption in uh, Flint, Michigan. Um, it's, it's just one thing. I mean, there's um, um, when you see it one place, it, right, people on their own will say, hmm, and they'll start looking around. Because you should expect, it, it, what it does is keep people honest. Because if people know you're looking around, they're more likely to be honest because they don't want to get caught. People don't expect to get caught, and they don't want to get caught. So if they have, if they have sensitive that people are, are looking around, then they will, for a while, um, uh, pl play by the rules. Sociology raises your consciousness that things aren't the way they seem. And if you're thinking about corruption, um, I mean, Philadelphia still, still has 
uh, examples of corruption in recent years, and it, you know and it's its history. Question you have a again. political machine. Here you have a long-standing political machine, and people have to give out favors, and one way or the other, con Ill contracts or, or doing this versus doing that, and um, it's not the way it should be. What similarities do you need to see in both places? Well, it depends what, what we're looking at. What are the factors that you need to see in the two separate places? Could you give me examples of factors that you want, that examples of the types of factors that you can see from one place to the other? Yeah, okay. Uh, historically, uh, and Philadelphia is a great example of it, GM got together with the uh, tire companies and the oil companies uh, starting in the 30s to get rid of trolleys around the country because they don't use, uh, GM didn't make trolleys, uh, petroleum companies don't make money because they don't use petroleum and they don't have rubber tires. So they went around on a lobbying effort around the country and got cities all across the country to get rid of their trolleys and put in buses, as happened in Philadelphia in, the, in, the, in about 57. Um, and so you can, you can there's a, a great documentary on this called Taken for a Ride that shows what happened in one city, happened in Detroit, Cleveland, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and so and so. And so you know, the public uh, found themselves uh, on old s smelly buses in the old days rather than on the trolley cars, which they liked. Um, and this was done by three, three corporations or types of industries getting together, and this is the impact on the public. But you can, the, you can see it, similar things happening in various cities. You look for it here, there it is over there. So what happened in Detroit happened in Cleveland. So if I can summarize what you're telling me, if you have similar demographics, social factors, and other economic circumstances in one area, and if our viewers can identify the same social factors, demographics, and economic circumstances in their own areas, yeah. they can know that they are likely to find similar behavior, behavior going on in their own right. location. Right. That's the problem. So once if you can raise people's consciousness, then they'll start looking. And and one of the things that uh, was found in by in uh, the predatory society is that most people don't expect to get cheated. And the more you trust the the shop owner or the or the whoever it is, the more likely you are to get cheated. So, uh, but if you don't trust them, then they can't cheat you. So what sociology does is. It Exposed raises consciousness, yeah. and it ex and the mechanic then expose the process, you know, to go behind the scenes and see what's going on. And once you get your consciousness get raised, then you may put pressure on the government. I mean, Flint, Michigan is a horrible example of this. But people, poor people, got together and now are uh, putting pressure, or have put pressure on the government. And now the state come in and the feds have come in, and uh, people are going to jail who uh, made these uh, bad decisions. How accurately does sociology predict human behavior? Not 100%, I'll never claim that, but um, what we do is compare it against randomness. You know, what is a random chance, what is a randomly, what's likely is occurring, and then the degree from which we depart from the randomness strengthens the, our patterns, because it's more than random that this is occurring. So if we have corruption in one place and corruption in another place, it's certainly not random that this is going on. There's something else going on. And then what you do is then you want to look for the patterns of causality that, that leads to this. Howard, I have been showing my viewers interviews, multiple interviews of township officials, experts, and candidates circumstances that are going on in Delaware County. A one-party rule, things like gerrymandering, problems of health care, and other factors. If people that don't live in Delaware County recognize identical circumstances to their town, how can sociology help them learn about their own hometown? I'm not a fortune teller. I can't tell exactly what type of corruption is going to occur where. No, no, no communities are identical. If you have certain things in one 
area and you go to another similar area, you might look to see if the same things are going on there. Often they are. Well, Howard, that's all we have time for today. Okay. I want to thank you for being a guest on a Delaware County Political News. I hope you found this interview helpful and informative. What I take from it is that there is sociological, scientific support of what we already know, and that's that if we as litigants see problems in the family court system, we're not alone. It's happening in other counties and other parts of the country, if not even the world. I take that somewhat as consoling, and it means that problems that we have in court aren't necessarily personal. The other important point that many of the problems in our court system are not necessarily caused by bad people. Power people, powerful people behave similarly. What I like to do is not focus on the bad people, although they do exist, I suppose, but it's on, I focus on the bad system that needs to be improved and reformed. You can go to my playlist about court reform to learn more about what I propose as reasonable reform measures and what stakes we can take to make them happen. As advocates, our actions that we take as a group matter because we all have a common battle to fight and it isn't in just our township or county or state that needs reform. It's other parts of the country as well as other places in the entire world. As a general matter, we shouldn't be forming dozens or hundreds of different nonprofits to reform the system. We should be merging and partnering together behind our common causes. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, and click the notification bell to be alerted of, new alerted of my new videos. Tune in every Tuesday night at 7, where you can watch with other live viewers. Please check the description portion of the video to learn more about that playlist of court reform and also learn more about my channel. Signing off. Tune in next time. Bye for now.